Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 442, interview with Roger Morehouse about his latest book, The Forgers, the forgotten story of the Holocaust's most audacious rescue operation. Historian Roger Morehouse, who specializes in modern German and Central European history, with particular interest in Nazi Germany, the Holocaust, and World War II in Europe, comes on to discuss how a Polish ambassador in Switzerland tried to help his countrymen as they are trapped inside the now-divided and occupied Poland. Mr. Morehouse, thank you very much for being with us today. My great pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I am so excited to have you on the show because unlike so many other interviews I have done over the years, this is a story that's not well known. And we're going to jump into it in a little bit. But could you first tell me, how did you hear about this story? Uh, Yeah, it it came to me in what must have been 2018. Um, I remember I had the proofs of my previous book, shameless plug here, but the previous book, uh, (laughs) 1939, uh, were on my desk. And I got got an email then from a Polish friend of mine Mm -hmm. uh, who uh, basically said that the story of the Wadosh group was kind of bubbling under a bit. It was sort of beginning to show, you know, there were sort of journalistic articles and newspaper articles and so on. Right. about it both in Poland and in Switzerland at the time and um and he said this is a really interesting story you know what do you think um and I sort of looked at it I looked at you know what had been written um and I thought it, I thought it was a brilliant story right. um it's a rare thing in that sense because it's it's a kind of a well a relatively positive story from the holocaust which is a which is a rare beast yes uh, so that appealed and and you know in a sense a lot of what i've been writing you know i've been writing about world war 2 and central europe all of my career and that meant you sort of circle around the holocaust uh, a lot without actually diving in and and telling the story of it right and i didn't want to just you know do a sort of synthesis of the holocaust because i thought that would be boring it's not bringing anything to the table um, and doing it in this way, so so telling this story and slotting it, slotting that into the wider history, the history of the Holocaust, I thought was a very good way of of ticking that box for me as well, and 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 telling that story. So it it, it worked on a lot of levels, I think. Right. And I think you said in, in another interview or not an interview a speech you were giving, I think it was in Ireland. Um, you were talking about because this is so not well known, you're hoping one of the things you're hoping for is that your this book, the story will once it gets out there, families can maybe go through the records and go, oh, maybe that's why we have this. Yeah, para- yeah absolutely. Uh, yeah. So. So, again, yeah, you're, you're hoping more comes from it, obviously. Yeah, I am. I'm, I've said I've said before, I, you know, this is the first the first word of the conversation, not the last word. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm really hopeful um, that, uh, that exactly that will happen, that, you know, families that have a sort of, a, you know, a mythical Paraguayan passport, <laughs> I mean, about 70% of the passports that they produced were Paraguayan. Wow. Um, so they could also be Honduran or, or Salvadorian, but mm. most of them were Paraguayan. Um, so, if, you know, any any of those families out there that have a Holocaust survivor that, you know, went through Belson uh, and survived somehow with a with a Paraguayan passport, right. chances are that, that they, they were saved by the Wadosh group. So, um, it, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, even in my research, I found that I found a handful of people that that had exactly that story that had these Paraguayan passports as part of their sort of family narrative of how they survived the Holocaust and had no clue where they had come from or what they signified. Right. Um, so it was, a, it was a real honor to be able to fill those gaps in the narrative. Absolutely. And you're right. This should be the first and not last word. And hopefully it will generate a lot of uh, more information uh, because yeah. Yeah, the more we know, the better. Um, Indeed. Before we go into this, uh, and you just mentioned a minute ago your previous book, Poland 1939. Speaking of that, I don't think I fully appreciated what was happening to the Jews and to the Poles in general once Germany comes in and then the Soviets come in on the other side. But the Mm. Polish Jews were truly in an untenable situation. And and this is what I took from your book. The Nazis Mm. hated them for racial reasons. The Soviets Mm. hated them for their world-class view. But even the non-Jewish Poles somehow equated Bolshevism with being Jewish. And they like, oh, you want the Soviets to come in. I mean, it's like these people couldn't win for losing the the, the Jews of yeah. Paul had it they had no friends it seems yeah like. no absolutely I mean I, th- I think we have to I mean you 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 clarified that that position actually in the beginning of that 
that statement there, mm. which was where you, you, you said both both um, Polish Jews and non-Jews. And we have to bear in mind that the, the situation in occupied Poland was horrific for both. I mean, it's right. not as though the Poles, the non-Jewish Poles were sort of living in, in relative comfort because they weren't. I mean, it, it was it was a, a truly dreadful place to be. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right in that, you know, certainly that period between 39 and 41, where Poland is divided between uh, the Germans in the West and the Soviets in the East. And yeah, there is there really is no safe space because, as you say, you know, that the, the that there's there's a racial hierarchy being enforced in the West, uh, right. in which the Jews are right at the bottom, and actually the Poles are only one rung up, so they're really not in a very comfortable position either. Right. Uh, and then in the Eastern zone, you have a sort of class hierarchy, where if you are, you know, middle class, if you have, if you're intelligent, if you're mm -hmm. educated, all of these sort of the, the list of categories that the Soviets had of various sort of social groups that they disapproved of, that they considered to be fundamentally anti-Soviet, was huge. Right. So unless you were really an ignorant, you know, farm worker, um, ideally illiterate, yes. um, you know, the, you, you fell into some degree of suspicion under the Soviet state. So absolutely, for the Jews, it was it was very difficult for them, in, even in the Soviet zone. They'd be persecuted for, on class basis or they'd be persecuted on, on religious basis. Right. So you're absolutely right. There was no safe space at all. Yeah, I guess at the end of the day, it doesn't matter why you're being persecuted. The fact is, you're being persecuted, and, and that's what these people are going through. So, mm. and I and I love this. You you uh, you're very careful with your words, obviously. And so, when we get to the part about the passports, um, you know, it's like it's a, it's a weird category. They're not technically illegal, but in some ways, they're fudged or they're without the proper so so it gets complicated really quickly but what i did yeah. not i don't think i appreciated again was the poles trapped on the soviet side are like we got to get out of here someone's got to get us out of here we need help so they start writing letters to anyone and everyone mm -hmm. they even if there's a chance they could be helped and some of those letters reach switzerland which sets off a chain reaction yeah it's one of those peculiarities because you know the wadosh group will I hope, you know, go down alongside the other, you know, uh, rescuers of Jews from the Holocaust. Right. Uh, and, and rightfully so. But actually the origins of it, and this is in the same way as, as we'll come back to Kiyune Sugihara in a, in mm -hmm. a little while, I imagine. Right. But in, in, in the same way as him, the origins of the operation lie actually in the Soviet zone of occupation of Poland rather than the, the German zone of occupation. Wow. Because the first passports that were issued by the group in Switzerland were to a couple of individuals who were in the Soviet zone needed to get out. And uh, it, 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 again, it speaks to that difficulty that Jews faced in the, in the Soviet zone, persecuted on a class basis or a religious basis. Right. Um, and it, as you say, they, they, they wrote letters in, the, in this case, that you know, the first documented example we have, there may be others, but this right. is the first documented example we have. Uh, was of a chap called Leo Weingold, who was in uh, Lviv, now Lviv in Ukraine, very much in the news. Mm -hmm. um, but then the, then the um, uh, Soviet-occupied former Polish city of Lviv, um, right. and and he wrote to his brother, who was in, happened to be in Switzerland, and said, you know, can't can't stand this occupation. I'm being watched by the secret police and all this yeah. sort of thing. Uh, you have to do something to help me. Uh, and and his brother went to the um, the Polish embassy and said, is there anything you can do? You know, how can you help my brother who's a Polish citizen right. uh, in, who's stuck in the Soviet zone of occupation? And, th and they said, well, we've heard that it's possible that we can, we can produce these Latin American passports and he might be able to get out that way, you know, through, uh, across the Soviet Union. Right. Um, so it was a kind of, a, it was building on what Kiyune Sugihara was already doing in the summer of 1940. Mm -hmm. um, but then giving it a particular twist, which was by by providing them with uh, providing him with a Latin American passport, uh, which, as you say, was it technically was not uh, forged. Right. So the title is a little bit of uh, publisher's hyperbole. I have to add. <laughs> right. um, they were not technically forged; they were illegally produced. Ah. So this was the um, it was done with the honorary consul of Paraguay, who was a Swiss. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was in Bern, and he and they knew him. So he was someone who was uh, uh, they knew was was willing to uh, bend the rules, shall we say, uh, for right. money. Right. Uh, so he supplied them with blank passports, which they filled out, sent back to him to be stamped and signed, uh, and so it went on, uh, all for a all for a rather healthy fee. Right. Um, so that's how it works. So technically, they're illegally issued 
or legally produced rather than forged. Who'd like another slice of free turkey? I'd love a slice of free turkey. White meat, please. Where'd you get this delicious free turkey? BJ's Wholesale Club. It's a free butterball turkey. Free drumstick, anyone? I want a wing. Are the wings free? The whole turkey is free. Get a free butterball at BJ's Wholesale Club when you spend $150 in one transaction between November 1st and 9th. Then your free coupon will appear in the BJ's Digital Coupon Gallery beginning November 11th. Go to BJ's.com slash free turkey for offer terms. Not a member? Join today. BJ's. Absurdly simple savings. And, and, and you stress this in your book, and you have to stress it over and over again. This is not a guarantee. This is a desperate shot. Maybe it'll work. It might, probably won't. But at least it's something that the, the Poles and the Jews and the Soviet side can at least have a piece of paper and go, this is why I shouldn't be here. So it's, it's a desperate attempt, I guess. What is that? Desperate times, desperate measures. Could, could you yeah. maybe give us some of the people involved in the Wadish group who were involved in this? Because um, yeah. they're coming from a good place. They're literally doing what they can do. And it's not that much, but they're going to do it anyway. Yeah. And just to come back to that first point, it is absolutely that. Because um, for a lot of them, those that, you know, the, the trap I just mentioned, Leo Weingold, now he, done, he didn't actually leave the Soviet zone. So by the time he received his passport, I think it was the spring of 1941. Right. Um, your listeners will know what happens in the summer of 1941, which is the German invasion of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So he ends up under German control anyway. Um, oh, wow. And arguably, and, and he says so in, in, in the correspondence, his passport saves his life from the Germans anyway. Right. So um, he, he then, you know, because he can pose as a foreign Jew and say, I'm, you know, I'm Paraguayan. Um, so that saves his life. But then by that stage, you know, by the, by the second half of 1941, you've got the Holocaust really going on in earnest, beginning mm -hmm. in earnest. Um, first of all, with the, you know, the mass shootings on the Eastern Front, these sort of, you know, um, very uh, brutal massacres of you know thousands of individuals every, almost every every town and village uh, experienced one of these massacres by the german einsatzgruppen right um so that that's the sort of the opening phase of the holocaust and then and then by the end of the year and the beginning of 1942 you've got the beginnings of industrialized killing as well at, mm -hmm. at uh, sites like helmno for example in, in occupied poland so already that winter the holocaust is really properly up and running Right. So large numbers of Jews who at this point, the vast majority of them are sort of corralled in ghettos across occupied Poland, um, are, are hearing the rumors of what's going on um, and desperate to beginning to be desperate to get find find some way out. So, they, mm -hmm. as we said before, they write, write letters to to anyone that they think might be able to help them. And some of those end up in Switzerland, end up in the right hands. Right. Um, and, and just a, the peculiar thing about these passports is that very often they would be sent back and it would be a you know you know the bearer is a is a is a citizen of the republic of paraguay right. and the bearer could well have been you know an orthodox jew um <laughs> with whose name was Yitzhak feldman and mm. uh you know and and uh, didn't even know where paraguay was on the map <laughs> um so kind of everybody knew that this was a ruse but, right you know we'll, we can come into this in in a little while but you know what's what's amazing is is how um, how this sort of fitted in with the Germans' view of the world and of, you know, the, the bureaucracy involved and, and why, in a way, they took it seriously. Mm -hmm. um, because it was, it, very often, it was sort of fairly obvious that this was a fraudulent um, operation. Right. Um, but to come back to your oh, uh, yes, original yes. question about those involved, about mm -hmm. the, about the Wadosh group themselves, um, Wadosh was the, uh, who gave his name to it, Alexander Wadosh was the Polish ambassador to Switzerland uh, right. from 1940 to 45. Um, and he was a very, he's probably the most sort of rounded figure in terms of, you know, the, the historical record has not been very kind to these these six, unfortunately. And right. this is part of a problem where where you are, to, you know, as I said, writing to some extent the first draft of a narrative. Mm -hmm. um there, there, there aren't that many materials that sort of flesh those characters out unfortunately but the one that is fleshed out the most is Wadosh himself right um and he had escaped from poland in 1939 as had so many others um and actually had been helped on his odyssey out of poland you know on foot right. um by a jewish family by an ordinary jewish family which i think stuck with him you know he he he, he took that to heart right um that they'd been willing to help him 
Um, and he'd also benefited in his own life from from using illegal paperwork. So way back in the First World War, oh. he'd been a Polish national agitator. Um, this was, you know, Poland was then under a, a, a tripartite occupation or um, uh, partition, as it were, right. uh, until 1914, until the outbreak of war. And he was in the Austrian partition in 1915 mm. uh, and had been sentenced to internal exile and sent to, to the Tyrol in Austria um for his polish you know patriotic agitation and he promptly escaped into switzerland using an illegal passport so he, even in his own life i mean obviously he couldn't necessarily have foreseen that he would one day become an ambassador right um but even his own life he had you know personal experience of benefiting from illegal paperwork so in a sense he, you know his destiny was was uh, written in the stars to some extent <laughs> Yes. Um, so he's, he's sent to Switzerland in 1914 and, and very swift. I mean, it, it's quite organic the way they come together. There are six members of the group. Wadosh himself, his deputy, his name is Stefan Rinievich, mm -hmm. uh, another chap called Rokitsky, who did most of the sort of the, the donkey work, the hard work of actually filling out the passports. Yes. Uh, Julius Kuhl was a member of his staff, local staff, who was, uh, was himself Jewish. Uh, and then two Jewish activists um, who worked with or headed up the um, aid agencies in Switzerland, who were Abraham Silberschein and Chaim Ice. And that was the crucial element here was that it was a, a Polish Jewish operation, effectively, mm -hmm. um, because you needed, you know, a lot of those letters that we talked about, those, those uh, you know, pleading letters for help right. ended up with the Jewish aid agencies in places like, like Switzerland. And if you were lucky, it ended up with Abraham Silberschein or Chaim Ice. Uh, and then they would sort of pass the letter on and it would and it would go into, if you like, into the production phase. Right. Um, so it was it, crucial to say it was a Polish Jewish sort of joint operation. Uh, and, and I don't want to pass by this too quickly. So there's a certain amount of bravery involved going, we're going to do this. It's not legal. I'm not certainly going to ask my bosses, can I do this? But at the same time, you're right. Someone's got to sit down and write, you know, or sign whatever one after the other. And, and they end up doing a lot of these. And so again, it's not only courage, but it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of time out of their, you know, their schedule, but they literally want to do what they can. And they have to know that this may not work anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It is a lot of work. And, and I think this is partly why, um, you know, it was so important that someone like Wadosh actually was willing to head it up and actually mm -hmm. sort of stand up for it. Right. You know, as I said before, all the, all, in a sense, all of the hard work was done by um, Konstantin Rokitsky, who actually filled them out. He has very distinctive handwriting, by the way, which is how we can know that, that he filled out most of the passport passports. Uh, um, and Stefan Rinievich and Julius Kuhl were very closely involved. And as, as I said, we know that the, um, the, the, the two Jewish activists were the sort of crucial conduit for a lot of the, the applications. Um, but Wadosh himself, you know, he he sort of stood by all of this, and he he when the crucially when the operation was began to be shut down by the Swiss police mm -hmm. uh, through 1943, again right. at the at the request of the of the Gestapo, right? Um, he was the one that sort of went to complain to the head to the chief of police and went to have a meeting with the, the uh, Swiss foreign minister, for example, wow. where he basically, you know, said. You know, this is a humanitarian operation, you know, call off the dogs. We're doing the best we can in a difficult situation. So he really did sort of try and stand up um, for for the rightness of what his group were doing. Right. And I think that's a that's a really crucial point. Yeah, I, I would like to think that we still have uh, convictions, people of con strong convictions and, and, and courage. But that certainly was him, you know. He's not hiding. He's literally going to his superiors and going, no, please let us continue to do that. So, again, bravery on his part yeah. that shouldn't be got yeah. forgotten. The The Japanese consul that you mentioned, was was he doing some of this before the Wadish group or roughly at the same time? Or was – who came first? It is, it is before. And it's, okay. it's a slightly different um, sort of version that he advocates or was, was carrying out. So he was – it's quite complicated actually. But sure. it, it sort of sort of provided – I um, wouldn't say a template almost, but it provided an example that that uh, the Wadosh group followed to some extent. Mm -hmm. Now, what he was doing, because as, as I said, there was the large numbers of Jews in eastern Poland, or occupied eastern Poland, then Soviet-occupied Poland, right. and, um, and the Baltic states, which were rapidly being Sovietized at the time. So they were being annexed through 1940. Mm -hmm. uh, so in summer of 1940, there are large numbers of primarily Polish, but other Jews as well, 
um, that are sort of, you know, um, congregating outside the embassies and the consulates of, of the, that are still functioning in Kaunas, which was then the, um, the, the Lithuanian capital. Right. Um, and his was one of those consulates. And uh, he, he thought, well, I have to, we have to do something with these, yeah. help, to help these people. He actually wrote to his superiors in Tokyo and said, you know, can I, can I start issuing visas? Mm-hmm. Um, and, the, and his superior said no. Um, so he he simply carried on and uh, chose to ignore what his superiors told him to do. Um, um, and w- along with the Dutch consul, whose name was Svartendijk, mm-hmm. um, they hatched a scheme whereby you know the, it was basically necessary to to satisfy the the bureaucratic requirements of the Soviet state. Right. Um, it, 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 it it simply wasn't possible for an ordinary citizen of the Soviet Union, and bear in mind all of those people in those countries areas annexed to the Soviet Union automatically became Soviet citizens. Mm -hmm. So it simply wasn't possible for them to leave the country, right? It just wasn't possible. That's not how the Soviet system worked. (laughs) So they created all of these um, uh, obstacles, bureaucratic obstacles to people leaving. Um, And one of them was that you had to have, you know, an end destination. You have to have transit visas to get across the Soviet Union. And before you do that, you have to have visas to wherever you're going. So wow. what, what um, Svartendijk and and Sugihara do is to uh, Sugihara is willing to to give um, transit visas across Japan, mm-hmm. uh, and and Svartendijk is willing to give visas to the Dutch colony of Curacao, which is in the Caribbean. Right. Um, and uh, in this way, I mean, actually, Curacao didn't need visas, but it satisfied that bureaucratic requirement of the Soviets right. to have some end destination, you know, uh, uh, registered. So in that way, if you, if you could get those two documents and then apply for a transit visa across the Soviet Union, which was also a Kafkaesque experience because you had to you had to use foreign currency and possession uh, of foreign currency in the Soviet Union was a crime. Right. So, wow, so one, yes. one, one branch of the bureaucracy was asking you to have foreign currency <laughs> in the knowledge that the secret police could arrest you for it. This, right. this is how the Soviet Union worked. So this was the way it worked. It's very, very complex and very bureaucratic. But it, they got out, you know, more than 2000 uh, people in that way, right mm-hmm. across the Soviet Union and across Japan and out uh, into into the free world. Um, and this kind of. I said the the um, the the, the Wadosh operation didn't work in the same way, but I think it sort of sparked a a, a realization that, that that bending the rules in that way was a possibility, and that people could benefit from uh, from you know the, you know officials in 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 senior sort of bureaucratic positions bending the rules. Right. And crucially, Sugihara had a couple of polls from the Polish Secret Service, actually um, uh, Polish intelligence rather. Mm-hmm. Um, that worked on his staff. So, so you know, the polls in London, in the government in exile, and in in places like Switzerland would have known pretty well what he was doing. Right. Uh, so it was it was quite an important example uh, that they that they sort of drew on. Right. Well, first of all, I have to say, when you were talking about the currency, the foreign currency, one side wants it, the other side says you're not allowed to have it. I, when I was reading your book, I did lose count of the catch 22s. I mean, it just, yeah. these people, I mean, but that's what the Germans were doing on purpose. They were literally making it so you, you couldn't get away in the Soviets to the same degree. But, and, yeah. And you stress this in the book, and I want everybody to understand, it's not like there was this massive, super organized program of helping the Jews uh, who were being persecuted. It was almost, it started out catch as catch can, and and like you said, words slowly spread out. And what I kind of picked up on... And you mentioned this as well. During the book, the um, the Nazis are going into what was Soviet-controlled territory, and they're getting better. They're getting more organized. They're ramping up their killing, whatever proper term is. But at the same time, this program, like the Vodish group, was doing the same thing. And so they're obviously on the opposite ends of the spectrum, but they're both getting more organized. They're getting better at it, and they're trying to be more effective. And, and they, they were just literally running against each other. And I just, and I just, again, I just want everybody to know this wasn't massively thought out and we're ready to go. This was just kind of, kind of built up steam and momentum as it went yeah. along. 
It is, it, it, and it's very much on, you know, it develops um, on the hoof, as it were, you know, ad hoc. <laughs> right. Um, absolutely right, you know. And, and actually both things, I mean, even this thing about the Holocaust as well, the Holocaust is a very organic, the way it develops is extremely organic and, sli- yes. and slightly chaotic, you know. This right. isn't, you know, there's a, there's been long been this sort of academic argument, which I won't bore you with for too much, sure. you know, between what they call the structuralists and the intentionalists, where, mm. you know, some people, some academics believe that hit right from the beginning, you know, right, right from the First World War, Hitler wanted to exterminate the Jews. Right. Um, you know, and he puts that into practice already in 1933. It's not really realistic. Um, the, the Holocaust, to a large extent, is a product of the circumstances of the Second World War. That's not to excuse the Nazis of, of any of nefarious right. intention, because they absolutely did intend to mm-hmm. get rid of the Jews. But it's how you, it's what get rid of actually means. Right? Yeah. Um, so the way it develops and, and the way that, as they call it, the Jewish question develops um, is because all of the other avenues for, you know, forcing those individuals um, via, you know, bureaucratic means, via petty persecution, forcing them into exile, all of those avenues are gone by 1941. Right. And you're just left with, you know, millions of former Polish citizens and former Soviet citizens, Jewish. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, the, and the question in Berlin is, what the hell are we going to do with them? And then the right. answer is, we'll kill them. Right. I and mean, it's brutal. But, but that's the way that there's a curiously organic sort of nature to how the Holocaust develops as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's very interesting. In, in case of the Wadosh group, that it, it, it is organic and it starts in, you know, in very in very small sort of very piecemeal ways that they're sort of sending passports to people that they know and friends and acquaintances and so on. And right. people who send, you know, specific requests in. And then that grows. And as the as the Nazi persecution grows, knowledge of it grows in Jewish circles in occupied Poland. Right. Um, then, you know, more letters arrive and then suddenly, but, you know, before you know it, the Wadosh group had sort of look at themselves and realize that they're, they're, they're doing a sort of, uh, you know, they've got a cottage industry and in producing Latin American passports. Right. And, so, and it's curiously organic as well. Yeah. I, I imagine just the sheer volume after a while even probably stunned them. They're like, yeah, we'll do everything we can. But this, I think it probably grew a lot bigger than they ever maybe imagined. Um, I, I, and, and you mentioned in your book, even Madagascar was considered at one point, let's, let's ship all the Jews. Yeah. Madag- we don't want them. Let's ship them out of here. No other country seems to want to be able to help. So you, you were right. Uh, the Germans were trying to come up with something. We just want them out of here. And at one by one, all these options are eliminated, and all that is yeah. left is elimination. It's extermination. It, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And and we have to include, and this certainly does not, this is not America's finest moment, but the U.S. State Department um, was, I don't even know how to put it, they certainly were not eager to help the Jews before the war started, as the war mm-hmm. started. Can you give us a, you know, just an overall quick history of the State Department's part in all this, or I guess I should say the lack of their part yeah. in all this, and how FDR tried to outflank his own State Department. Yes. Uh, it's a it's a very, it's kind of a, a crucial strand of the story. Mm-hmm. Um, I start, actually, the first chapter of the book, I start with um, uh, it's a, a narrative of the um, Evian Conference of June, right. July, I think it was July, mm-hmm. 1938. So before the war and before the Holocaust. But the Evian Conference was called to by FDR um, to supposedly deal with, to address the Jewish refugee problem that, that the world was facing in the aftermath of the German annexation of Austria, the Anschluss of March of 1938. Mm-hmm. So large numbers of Austrian Jews suddenly found themselves you know, in the, in the Third Reich and uh, were desperate to get out. And right. this conference was called to address that problem. The problem is that the conference did precisely nothing to address yes. that problem. Right. Um, there was lots of uh, hand wringing. There was lots of expression of sympathy, um, and there was lots of buck passing because the Europeans basically said, "Well, this isn't our problem. We're full. You know, we've all got immigrant populations. Uh, we are uh, not willing to take more on because mm-hmm. they would be problematic." Mm-hmm. Uh, and say, well, it's for the outside world, for you know, Latin America and so on, to uh, step up. And you know, they have large num- you know, large territories and small populations, comparatively speaking. So it's for them to step up. And the Latin Americans predictably said, well, it's not our problem; it's a European problem. 
uh, and we don't want you know large numbers of uh, as they often put it sort of urban intellectuals which is <laughs> kind of yeah. code for jews right. uh, uh that we don't want large numbers of urban intellectuals uh we want we want farm laborers sort of thing that's what we need mm-hmm. so they, they sort of kick the can down the road both sides and then eventually as these conferences tend to do they congratulated themselves for having done having done such a great job Right. Uh, when actually they'd done precisely nothing to, to alleviate the problem. But yeah. the reason I tell the story in the book is that it's very instructive of international attitudes towards what we might call the Jewish question and Jewish problem. Mm-hmm. Um, because the outside world really didn't want to deal with it. They would, they thought it was, you know, it, not their priority. It was something that, you know, if they could possibly kick it down the road, they would do so. Right. Uh, nobody particularly wanted large scale or even small scale Jewish immigration. So yes. Evian is actually a really instructive example of the, the attitude of the outside world, because I think, and I've said this before, I think um, our, our assumption when we look back at this history from the, you know, the comfort or relative comfort of 2023, mm-hmm. we imagine that, you know, Britain and America and the free world, as it were, um, were willing to help, um, help the Jews during the war with the Holocaust, um, but were frustrated in that because of logistical concerns, because they didn't have you know, knowledge of the Holocaust, uh, what was going on. Um, they didn't have, you know, it wasn't possible to, you know, to intercede in any way you couldn't right. bomb the rail lines to auschwitz and all those sorts of arguments and i think we assume that there were lots of the obstacles to us getting involved and helping but the but the, the but the will was there right. and i think every and a later there's a later conference at bermuda as well between the british and the americans which is in 1943 yes and they basically say the same thing is that oh you know there's nothing we can do right um i think that there's proof there and there's there's countless other documents through the book and 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 i have to say the u.s state department was a a fairly a fairly um egregious um example of 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 that sort of negative attitude um uh there's a lot of examples there where you know the assumption that the outside world is benign towards this is really mistaken Mm-hmm. Um, the outside world, I would say, is at best indifferent and at worst hostile. Right. Um, and again, motivated by, you know, low level latent anti-Semitism to a large mm-hmm. extent. Yeah. Um, and the State Department, you know, again, it, it, it plays a, a really negative role. I mean, crucially, as I say, you know, that after December of 42. Right because this is when the information comes out, and it's actually publicized by the Polish government in exile. It's a thing called the Raczynski Note, where mm-hmm. they, they, they collate all of the available intelligence of the ongoing Holocaust and publish it. Um, and it's addressed to the, to the Allied powers. Mm-hmm. Um, so after that point, you know, it's discussed in the House of Commons and all of this stuff. Um, after that point, nobody in a position of power, political power in the right. outside world can claim ignorance of what's going on. Yeah. Nobody, right? Right. The State Department still, by 1944, right, so 18 months later, mm-hmm. is still saying to the Paraguayans, for example, "Well, you you don't want to you don't want to recognise these passports because that's a that's a bad move. You know, you don't want to do that wow. um, because you know it's rewarding illegal activity." That was the line that they gave, and um, uh, and they were very worried about um, about. The possibility that these passports might be used for Axis um, espionage, for example. Right. Um, so they really played a pretty inglorious role, it has to be, has to be said, in this story. Um, so much so, and even this is something that even Roosevelt recognised because mm. he set up the war the, the war refugee board in 1944, mm-hmm. um, essentially to bypass his own State Department. <laughs> Yes. On these issues, right? Because he, he, you know, he had his own placement in the Border Refugee Board, much more dynamic, much more forward-thinking. Um, you know, not quite so hidebound and sort of sclerotic as the as the uh, State Department was. Um, so, you know, he's even trying to bypass his own State Department in '44, which is which is kind of backs up my point to a large extent. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, but the, the key thing was the key thing is that after they stopped producing these passports, they stopped at the end of '43. Mm-hmm. And after that point, and this is just something I want to make clear in case what I've just said was not didn't make make sense to our to our listeners. Right. 
Um, after that point, they reckoned that there are about um, 10,000 uh, individuals that, that, that were holding these, these passports and identity documents in the various camps um, of Nazi Germany. Now, the key thing is that these, these um, passports meant that you basically, you, got, you were pulled out of the, the, the line that was going to go to Auschwitz-Birkenau, to, to, to um, uh, extermination. And they, and they would reclassify you as an exchange Jew. Right. And exchange Jews would be sent to the concentration camps, most notably Bergen-Belsen, which was a particularly horrible concentration camp. But exchange Jews, because they had value to the Nazis, they were kept in relatively good conditions in Bergen-Belsen. Mm. They had value because the, the Germans wanted to be able to exchange them for Germans held abroad, hence the phrase exchange Jews. Right. So... That was that was the situation for those we estimate, and they estimated themselves about ten thousand individuals. Mm -hmm. um, after forty three, after they've stopped producing the passports, then you know all of those ten thousand are in various camps, and then it's dependent on the outside world actually coming forward and recognizing those passports as prima facie genuine. Right. right. Um, the Paraguayans had been informed of what was going on; they knew that these passports had been issued illegally. Mm -hmm. uh, and their first reaction was to be offended and say, well, this is a, an affront to our national sovereignty. And of course, we're not going to recognize those passports uh, because they've been illegally issued. Uh, at which point, you know, the Polish government in exile, which has its diplomatic network, is contacting everyone it possibly can in Latin America, in Vatican, you know, the State Department in the U.S., yeah. They basically say you have to pressure these people to recognize, say that they will recognize those passports. Yeah. It doesn't mean that thousands of Jews are going to descend on, on Asuncion and Paraguay. That's exactly. not going to happen. It yeah. just means that the Germans will not kill them if they believe they are foreigners. Right. Right. So they're trying to trying to push this idea that they, that those those um, passports be recognized. And at the same time, the State Department is in the ear of the Paraguayan government saying you don't want to do that. Right. So this is why it becomes crucial. And all the time, the Germans are waiting on this and saying, well, if these people are not going to be recognized as Latin American Jews, then, then they're just Jews. Right. And we know what happens to them in 1944. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. So large batches of these unfortunate um, exchange Jews uh, through 1944 are shipped off to Auschwitz and murdered yes. uh, because of that hesitation in that whole question of recognition. So this is why it becomes crucial that the outside world step up and put pressure on the Latin Americans to, to recognize those passports. And that's why uh, I single out the, the State Department. That's why I think they, they failed so egregiously to do that, because they were, they were uh, advising the other way. Exactly. Yeah. And, and again, not, and, and if I remember correctly in your book, some people, obviously there was anti-Semitism. Some people were like, well, this is illegal and we don't do illegal things or we don't respect or acknowledge. I mean, that's just ridiculous when you consider what they're trying to achieve, which is save lives. Um, but, yeah. And I remember one part of your book, it's like the Paraguayans know that one, if any Jews come, and again, that was not the point. Uh, yeah. the, the Nazis have already taken all of their money and their property. So they're poor and they're probably diseased. And you want us to take a whole bunch. I mean, there was a lot of, you know, everybody looking out for themselves, which is human yeah. nature. But at the same time, there are occasions when you have to rise up and do better than that. I, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, that was, that in a sense, was kind of my guiding um, principle, if you like, as far as I had one through the book, was that, you know, right. you, you sort of want people to do better in this sort of crisis situation. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was... Hugely impressed, particularly like with the Wadosh group themselves. I mean, they mm -hmm. had limited means, but they managed by hook or by crook and very organically, as I said, they're not geniuses. They just decided to try and do something and it worked to some extent. Right. Um, they had limited means and they just, they just did what they could and they saved lives and they would yeah. have saved many more lives if other people had kind of, you know, got behind it in the, in the right way as well. So, you know, I think they showed in a way what was possible and just, it was just very, very unfortunate that, um, that others didn't quite see the light in the same way. Right. And, and we'll get to this when, when we're near the end. But I, I imagine that you're going to probably think that when a lot of people finish reading this book, hopefully one of the first thoughts they have is, Never again. Let's let's learn from yeah. this. Let's do better. And you're and even though the the Polish 
government in exile did not start this. When they did find out about it, they certainly pushed. They paid for a lot of these passports. They did everything they could. They just needed more people on their side, more people going along with them. And it could have made significant difference as far as the numbers that have survived, at least potentially. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, that, I think the in terms of sort of governmental uh, players in my book, um, right. I think, you know, the government in exile, Polish government in exile is is probably, I would say, the only one that comes out of this with any credit at all. I mean, even, I mean, the Swiss are uh, uh, not don't come out of this positively. The Germans obviously don't. I, w- I was surprised about that American connection. I must say, it's something I, you know, I didn't necessarily yeah. know at the beginning when I started the book, and that's something that emerged through my research. So yeah, that, I mean, actually, the Poles, the, the Polish government in exile, you know, really, this this is a glorious page, I think, in in Polish diplomatic history. Yeah. Um, the way they tried to go into into bat to um, to to sort of back up the Wadash group, as you said, they didn't. The government in exile didn't actually know about it at the beginning. Right. Um, so Wadash set it up and started doing this from 1941 onwards. Um, and the, there's this, I think, hilarious moment. In the middle of '43, at, the, at which point the Wadosh Group is in the process of being closed down by the Swiss authorities, mm-hmm. the Wadosh gets a telegram from London, which it, which says, um, uh, "You know, we've heard that there's this possibility that you can pr- produce Latin American passports and help Jews to escape the Holocaust, right. and we'd like you to investigate this and see if you can get involved." Okay. Um, <laughs> and he basically writes back and says, "Thank you know, thanks for explaining my operation to me that I've been doing for two years." You're uh, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, so, the uh, irony. <laughs> yeah, the irony, exactly. Uh, but I mean, what uh, you know, he, operational security from him, his perspective, you know, he didn't want to necessarily tell people that that didn't need to know. Right. Um, maybe I mean, the, the, you know, the sources aren't clear, but it's it's quite possible that he didn't want to be told no at the outset, so he chose not to tell them. Right. Um, that's quite possible, but it's that's that's supposition. Um, sure. what's, what's very positive is that once he did tell them that it was underway, um, the, the government in exile, you know, got behind it, put money behind it. They paid mm-hmm. for it. They paid huge sums of money, which ultimately end up with this, um, honorary consul, Rudolf Hoopley, um, to, to produce more passports. So they, they fully got behind the operation. And crucially, as I said, the, the sort of follow on operation to ensure or try to ensure. Right. That those passports were recognised by the respective authorities. So yeah. I think that was it. It is a it is a chapter of glory for the Polish diplomatic history. Absolutely. Yes, and I think you mentioned in, in a speech you gave that maybe like fifteen or twenty. I can't remember twenty years ago, the Swiss government did some kind of um, research or paper or whatever on their part in this. Um, so maybe they acknowledged their, sh- I can't remember. They acknowledged yeah. their shortcomings. Uh, I could have done. Yeah. More. They had, there was a, a large scale sort of historical inquiry into, uh, you know, S- Switzerland's wartime history and, and, you know, collusion with the totalitarian powers and so on. And it is a very, it is a very complex history. Right. Um, which I think a lot of people don't necessarily think about. Um, you know, in the grand scheme of World War II, it's a, it's a relatively minor mm-hmm. um, element. But it, it, it's interesting to see, you know, how complex that relationship was. Because if we assume that Switzerland is kind of free, right, um, in Europe, in in German, you know, German dominated German occupied Europe, it really isn't. Right. Because it has this, you know, this it has this big brother of Nazi Germany. Um, uh, looming over it, and the threat of invasion is there all the time. So they deal with that threat first of all by being extremely belligerent mm-hmm. in all of their public expressions. You know, saying that if you if if we're invaded, we'll fight to the last man. That sort of thing. Right. Um, and at the same time, actually bending over backwards to accommodate most German requests. Um, right. So you know, the Poland. Uh, sorry, Switzerland really isn't you know 100 percent free in this period. And yeah. this is partly why the why the Wadosh operation was closed down in forty three is because the Gestapo wanted it closed down. Exactly, and 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 if I may say, you do a very good job in your book about keeping the complexity 
of everything that's going on in the forefront as far as the rescue, the, the, the illegal passports. That was very complex, what the, what the Germans yeah. were trying to do with their exchange. Because because one of the first things I thought of was, why in the heck would the Nazis care about someone's nationality? It's not like they're known for respecting things, but for yeah. them, it was a calculation. They wanted to get some of their people back, and so it made sense, but there was no yeah. compassion or anything like that. But everything is nuanced. Everything is complicated. Everything is interrelated with everything else. And you can't just touch one thing without affecting something else. And so the yeah, Swiss true. government had to be, and, and I think you mentioned, I mean, you know, it's, the Swiss has a very large German population. They were probably yeah. pro-Nazi to some degree. And so, yeah, it's a complicated, delicate issue. Absolutely. And I, I, this is the thing. I mean, I, 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 I am freelance. I do a bit of um, university teaching. Mm -hmm. as a visiting professor and one of the things i always say is that you know you have to embrace the complexity i mean simple answers are almost always wrong answers um so you do have to embrace the complexity and then and then the second point um you know that i always say that there's that there's no concept that is so complex that it can't be expressed in simple language so you know that's then a challenge for the for the for the author to actually you know explain that complexity in a in a um in a digestible way and i i hope i've done that but uh you know Uh, that's a challenge for, for all of us that, yeah. that are in the business. No, I, I think you did an excellent job, and it made sense. And it was like all these divergent parts. And as the story goes on, you bring them together. You show how they're connected, and that really helped it gel for me. So, yeah. as, as you're going, as you're thinking, as you're going through this, you know, we all we've all heard of Oscar Schindler. Um, now we know yeah. the Wattish the Wattish group. Are there other people that should be, I, I guess, should not be forgotten for trying to help either groups or individuals during the Holocaust? Is there anyone else that we should hold up? in high regard yeah i think i mean i'm uh, you know as, as you've heard i mean the, the, my last few books have been on polish history so i've particularly been in, involved in in uh, polish wartime history so there's a few examples there um that really you know deserve to be much better known outside outside poland right um the best example is uh, a woman called irena sendler Mm-hmm. Um, who was a social worker? I mean, it sounds bizarre, but you have to you have to understand that the Polish underground right. um, under German occupation was not just a sort of military formation. It, it was really a shadow government. Mm-hmm. They had ministries, you know. Mm-hmm. They had ministries. They had a you know functioning educational system, all in the underground, all under the you know under the noses of the Germans. Uh, functioning judiciary, for example, wow. um, and they, and she worked for uh, for the um, Ministry for Social Works, and she actually was in that capacity. She was she smuggled babies, Jewish babies, out of the Warsaw Ghetto, and they wow. reckon that she smuggled up to two hundred two and a half thousand Jewish babies out of the Warsaw Ghetto, and wow. took them to things like convents, um, to uh, non-Jewish sort of foster families to, right. to to raise them and so on. So again, the numbers that actually survived the sort of the, the wider conflagration, I don't know. But the figure that's always given is two and a half thousand that she got out, you mm-hmm. know, physically smuggling them out of the ghetto. Right. Now that's a story that the outside world needs to know better because Absolutely. it's remarkable. It's truly remarkable. Um, you know, and then so. Another example would be you know, non non Polish. This one, but you know, someone like um, uh, Raoul Wallenberg working mm-hmm. in, in wartime Budapest. Um, so you know, issued lots of documents and sort of um, uh, provided accommodation for fugitive Jews and so on in Hungary. So he's another one. He is better known, I think. But uh, right. you know, he's a good example. And there is there are countless others actually. I mention a few of them in passing just to give context in the book. You know, mm-hmm. people like um, Thomas Kendrick, who was the um, passport officer, intelligence officer in the British embassy in Vienna um, at the beginning of the war. Right. And, uh, Henrik Swavik is another another Pole who was operating in uh, in wartime Hungary. You know, that there are large numbers of people who are involved in doing this sort of thing. And, and, and it's it, it, it's it. They're, they're heroic stories, a lot of them, and they, they do deserve to be better known. We in a strange way. Brilliant, though, the story of Oscar Schindler is, and particularly the film Schindler's List, right? which is you know, one of my favorite films. I think it's, I think it's an amazing film. Mm. But he's a, he's a sort of curiously tainted individual. And what makes the story fascinating yes. is that he starts as a, you know, quite dyed-in-the-wool Nazi exploiter of, of Jewish and Polish labor and all of that. And mm. it's his moral shift where he shifts to a position of helping. 
that right. that creates the brilliance of that narrative. But he's a, he's fundamentally quite an unpleasant character, certainly yes. at the beginning. Yeah. That, but I, I completely understand it's that narrative arc that it makes it so fascinating. But exactly. you know, there are other examples. Someone like Irena Sendler is absolutely an unalloyed heroine. You right. Know? Yes. Um, and yet her story rarely gets told outside Poland. So, you know, there's some peculiarities there that we have to we have to iron out. It, see, it sometimes seems to me quite peculiar that, you know, the poster boy for saving uh, Jews from the Holocaust uh, is, uh, is, is Oskar Schindler because, right. you know, he's... He was a died in the wool Nazi for most of his career. Yeah, I guess there's hope for all of us if he can change. I suppose so. Yes, yeah. it's the redemp it's the redemptive aspect that is exactly that is, uh, so appealing. Yeah. So, out of all the people that you mentioned, and I'm sure there's more. I'm, I'm I like you. I'm sure we we wish there would been had been more people that were saved. But the good news is those that were saved you know, probably went on, they lived their lives, they got married, they had kids, they had grandkids. And so there's, there's something beautiful in that. And you wish the numbers could be different. But even mm. then, it's, it's still an amazing story. And lives were changed, saved and touched mm. dirt for, for all their heroism. Yeah, absolutely. And then there's, I, I finished the book with that as a, a lovely, very touching line from the Talmud, which says, you know, he who saves one life saves the world entire. I and like I think that. that kind of puts paid to that I think rather, it's a rather cruel, brutal argument that, you know, occasionally gets sort of pointed at, at um, you know, groups like the Wadosh group and say, well, they didn't save many people in the end effect. So was it worth it? Well, it's absolutely worth it. If absolutely. even if just save one life, it was worth it. You know, it's certainly worth it to their, to that person's um, uh, uh, um, uh, family and so on. So, you know, we know, for example, that um, about 850 plus survived with Lat with uh, Wadosh passports. Mm -hmm. The estimation is they've done this wonderful um, uh, sort of statistical analysis. The estimation is that between two and 3,000 might have survived. Right. Um, the problem is that the vast majority of recipients of these passports and, and identity documents had no idea where they'd come from. So uh -huh. the, you just have this sort of, you know, as I said before, this sort of mythical Paraguayan passport. And you know, there's no attached narrative that this came from Switzerland or it came from the Wadosh group, it came from the Polish ambassador, whatever it is. Right. That is that part of the narrative was was hidden to everybody. Yeah. So that's that to some extent explains why um you know the hope is, as we said at the beginning, mm -hmm. that uh, this book will, uh, you know, uh, awaken long dormant memories of Paraguayan passports in the family and, and, and we'll, we'll find some more of those survivors. That's, that's my fervent hope. Absolutely. And so the important thing to take from this is the attempt has to be made. It's not about numbers. It's, it's just trying to do the right thing at the right time to help people who are unable to help themselves. So, uh, Ms. Morehouse, thank you very much for coming on the show. Ab obviously, thank you very much for this book. If I could end on a lighter note um, than mm. what we've been talking about, is it true that you read for the audio book? Um, I did. Okay, because I just finished that. I walk my dog a lot, and I just finished that. And I think you've got a future in this. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> if, if the writing and the professing doesn't work out, you've you've got a future as a reader. But but anyway, no, I, I I enjoy that. I enjoy the the pace and the cadence, and it really does take the story to a whole nother level. Uh, so that's, I, again, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it very much. Absolutely. So again, Mr. Mr. Morehouse, thank you for your time. And I hope you have a pleasant rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you.